So thank you so much for being here. And so without a first and delay at all, I would like to introduce to Dr. Nancy Kleinman. Thank you. So what brings us here today is this new discovery that you all might have seen in the paper. Um, let's, can we dim the lights down so people can see that, that slide? Okay, that's great, super. So let's just go ahead and get this started. I started with a little background stuff. There's three parts to my talk, okay? Part one, a little background for those of you that are sort of new to the world and don't realize all the work that's been going on. Part two, all about this virus and its implications. Most of my talks about that. Part three is a, a plenty of time for questions and answers. So there's going to be a, a lot of, of informal time. That's usually the best anyway. So if I get too long-winded, you all can just tell me to stop. <laughs> but I do get excited. Um, some of you might recognize this. This is the CFS Faces Project from the CFIS Association of CAA. It's a, it's a really neat thing they have that goes around the country and shows up in shopping malls. But the point of the Faces Project is that it's an invisible illness, that the people that have this illness look fine, but they are not fine. And it's a very important uh, message because chronic fatigue syndrome is a very debilitating condition. And, and uh, there been, there's been research that looked at how severely ill people are with chronic fatigue syndrome and it was the same or worse than congestive heart failure, the same or worse than very late stage AIDS. It was, it was a very, it's very impressive how very ill people are. And of course, most of y'all are living it, but some of you all might not realize that the science bears that out. It's been a hard illness to understand because we had to diagnose it by symptoms only. Okay, but the symptoms are pretty impressive and some things are special uh, to make, to really help break, the, make the, the diagnosis. One is the profound nature of the fatigue. It's not that, oh, I'm tired too, fatigue. It's the profoundly debilitating fatigue that prevents you from being able to do the normal things that people try to do in their lives. And they define that by saying that it, you cannot do at least one aspect of your life well. If you're working, more or less, that's all you're doing. You're not taking care of your family. If you're trying to take care of your family, you probably aren't having any real social or recreational time or work for that matter. So it takes away the very big and, and crucial ways that we define ourselves as, as people and how we value our contribution. But it's also defined by pain and inflammation, um, muscle pain, joint pain, um, sore throat, tender lymph nodes, headaches, non-restorative sleep, and, um, and uh, most importantly, concentration and cognitive problems that can interfere with your ability to, to be as quick as you would like to be. There's also a clinical case definition. That was a research case definition. The clinical case definition was more of a teaching thing to try to teach doctors that use this that there is something underneath all of that, that those are autonomic symptoms, that those are immune symptoms, that those are, are neuroendocrine symptoms, and then they cluster those symptoms around the, um, the type of, of um, underlying system is, that's acting badly to cause those symptoms. And w this was a, a clinical case definition made by an international group in Canada, and, and I was um, a member of that group. I wasn't a member of that first group. I didn't name this disease. No one blamed me. <laughs> I, was not, I was not there. I was not invited. <laughs> uh, there are overlapping conditions. About 60% of people with chronic fatigue syndrome also have fibromyalgia. And fibromyalgia is a painful condition. And that's what it is. It's a painful condition. It's, it's, it's defined by pain. You poke people in 11 different places, or sorry, 18 different places, and if, if 11 of them or more hurt, then they make the, make the case definition. But underneath that is a very complicated cause. There's a, a, an infl it's a, a pain ramp up that happens in the spinal cord and brain, sending more and more and more pain signals up to the pain center. And, uh, and even very light, non-painful touch can be very, very painful. Even it's the, the, you've heard people say, even my skin hurts. Gulf War illness is something near and dear to my heart, and, and, and I know Mac, because we both do research in this area, we have some Gulf War guys in the, in the audience here. Gulf War illness can also meet the case definition for chronic fatigue syndrome. They overlap. And much of our research um, in Miami is trying to decide if they are the same or not, and if they are, you know, if the treatments might be the same. That's one of the major focuses we have, and we have some really cool studies going on. 
I, I want the Gulf War guys to know that I shipped off those boxes to the Whittemore Peterson Institute yesterday to anyone that's in my uh, Gulf War study is having their XMRV serology and blood testing done very shortly. So I'll be getting back to you as soon as they, they tell me. So we'll know if it's truly overlapping in the same way. And then multiple chemical sensitivity is even more poorly understood, a difficult illness uh, to have and a difficult illness to diagnose. One of the issues with chronic fatigue syndrome all along has been the attitudes of physicians. And, and, and there have been a number of studies done. Lenny Jason did one. This is a different one. that looked at um, the attitudes of doctors. They even recognize the illness as real. And it works out about 50-50. And the p doctors that do generally have a family member who's ill. Generally speaking, that their connection is not their specialty or their training or anything else. It's their, their, their link, their personal link to a person with the illness. So what about viruses? Well, so much of the work that's been done in chronic fatigue syndrome has been on mental illness and depression and atypical depression. And the patients have gotten a, a bad rap. And I'm going to say this sort of in a funny way. <laughs> this is my own personal opinion. The, the, uh, part of the reason why there's so much psychology work done is that this is a very interesting illness from the psychologist's point of view, as is any really serious chronic illness. Patients with HIV have a huge <coughs> mental health literature. Patients with renal disease or renal failure have a huge mental health literature. Because one thing you can really do for people with a chronic disease is try to help them live with it, cope with it better, and then try to have the best quality life that, that, that is reasonable. And so most of that mental health literature is actually focused on that. All that cognitive behavioral therapy work and so on is focused on that. I think where chronic fatigue patients got really angry, and I, I totally understand, is when some researchers went off on the tangent that this is, that this is a form of some atypical form of a primary mental condition. And I think we disproved that in 1993 or four. I mean, it was a long, long time ago that all those endocrine studies came out that showed that Basically, this illness goes in the opposite direction from all the neuroendocrine point of view than uh, depression or that sort of thing. But still, there's been this cloud lying over folks with this illness because we never came up with a very clear understanding of what the primary cause might be. And much of the excitement about this virus is that, that it, it's a, a candidate for being a primary cause. So it's, it's a very exciting time.